Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 3130 Modern Geometries for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'm your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Um, I should warn you before we jump into this lecture that this one's going to be a long one. Um, it basically is one proof, but the proof is going to be kind of long. Uh, you'll understand when we get to it there. Uh, so I confess this movie isn't going to be as long as like Avengers uh, Endgame or anything like that. It's not going to be as long as the year you had to wait between Avengers Infinity of War and Endgame. Um, but anyways, it's going to be long for our geometry lectures right here. Uh, we are going to talk today about projective geometry. And before we get into the projective geometry part, I want to kind of give you some idea of why we're talking about projective geometry. Um so in the last couple of lectures, we've been talking about Euclidean geometry and hyperbolic geometry, uh, which are the two options one gets uh, when we have uh, neutral geometry, right? Because uh, neutral geometry, as the name suggests, is we stay neutral about our uh, parallel postulate, uh, but then we did make a decision, okay, what if we assume the Euclidean parallel postulate, what can we do? What if we assume the hyperbolic parallel postulate, what can we say about our geometry? And there's a lot of stuff that's similar between Euclidean and hyperbolic geometry because they're both neutral geometries. Um, but our final, our final goal in this discussion of modern geometries is to talk about elliptic geometry, uh, which elliptic geometry is a little bit more of a challenge, right? Uh, the elliptic parallel postulate, which you can see right here, um, states that all lines intersect. That is, there is no parallel lines. And so this, this is somewhat of a problem because in uh, neutral geometry, you have the following result. Um, if you have any line L and you have a, a point off of that line, call it P, then we can construct uh, the perpendicular drop from P onto L, like so. We'll just call it T. And then we can also erect from the point P a perpendicular line to, uh, to, to, to line T here. So we get this perpendicular angle right there. Uh, we'll call that line M. And then it's a consequence of the alternate interior angle theorem uh, that this lines L and M are going to be parallel. This line M is the so-called guaranteed parallel line that goes through P. So when you look at this argument right here, this construction, uh, it's somewhat incompatible with the elliptic parallel postulate. And the main culprit here is going to be the alternate interior angle theorem. And we'll talk about this more in the next lecture, lecture 34. Uh, but we're going to have to we're going to have to deal with this this situation, right? How can we construct a geometry that kind of locally resembles Euclidean geometry, but satisfies the elliptic parallel postulate? We have to be a little bit careful uh, because how do you just throw out the alternate interior angle theorem? It, we'll talk about how we'll do that, but we one has to be sort of careful, right? We don't necessarily want to destroy all of the structure of geometry we've developed this semester. And so one has to be a little bit careful on how do we approach this elliptic geometry conundrum that we have right now. And so we'll see, this will make much more sense next time as well, but it turns out that the, the solution, the, the, uh, the way of reconciling these contradictory uh, desires, uh, notions of congruence with the elliptic parallel postulate is to go down the avenue of projective geometries. So uh, with regard to Wallace and West textbook, we can say that this section uh, can be found in section 7.2 about real projective geometry, but what we're going to talk about right now really uh, is not exactly what's talked about in that section. We have to make the connection somewhere or another. So earlier this in this lecture series, we had talked about the notion of projective geometry, but very, very briefly. Um, you'll recall that we had talked about incidence geometry, which is a geometry which satisfies the four axioms that the, the, what, what Hilbert called the four incidence axioms. We have line determination, secant C, point existence, and non-collinearity. Um, an affine geometry was then an incidence geometry which we equipped the Euclidean parallel postulate to. And then we also defined around that same time period a projective geometry, was an, which was an incidence geometry which satisfies the elliptic parallel postulate. And we strengthened the secancy axiom. Secancy said that every line had at least two points on it. For a projective geometry, we require that every point had, or every line had three points on it. And it might seem a little bit weird why 
why did we require three points on a line? Well, the issue is kind of like we didn't want things like fan geometry to be considered projective geometry. And at the moment, you just thought I was a bigot because it's like, why? Why can't fan geometry be projective? You're just so rude, right? They have feelings too. Yes, fan geometry does have feelings, but it doesn't, uh, fan geometry doesn't follow the proper taxonomy of what ought to be uh, projective geometry. And we're going to talk about that sort of why in this lecture, this tricancy axiom. Um, the why, why tricancy will actually become very apparent because of that one massive proof we're going to do. It's going to use tricancy several times. We wouldn't be able to do it on fan geometry. So let's remind ourselves exactly what the definition of projective geometry is. Uh, you can see the axioms right here. Uh, there are five axioms to projective geometry. The first one, the first four are essentially just the incidence axioms. Axiom one are line determination. Axiom, for each two distinct points, there exists a unique line containing both of them. Like I mentioned before, we're going to upgrade axiom two of incidence, the secancy axiom. We're going to upgrade it to tricancy. And I, I confess, uh, tricancy is probably one of the most made up words you'll ever see in this course. Um, it's it, it's got a fun sound to it, right? Uh, it's an amalgamation between triple and, and secancy, right? And it kind of makes you sound, think of like geomancy or like necromancy, you know, these fun little black magic spells we could do. But anyways, tricancy is going to say that for every line, there exists at least three, three points on the line. So that's a little bit stronger than we usually require uh, for incidence geometry. And the main issue is that we don't want the fan geometry to be considered a projective geometry. Um, the other axioms are, as we've seen before, axiom three point existence. There exists at least three, three points uh, in the geometry. That's the axiom for incidence. We can actually prove stronger statements than that. Um, and we'll see forthcoming. Uh, Non-collinearity, not all points lie on the same line. And then for our parallel postulate for projective geometry, uh, we do take the elliptic parallel postulate, which is to say that all lines intersect or there, there are no parallel lines. Or another way of saying it is that given a line and a point off the line, there's no lines that go through the point which are parallel. You know, those type of th statements are all equivalent to each other. And we have seen some examples of projective geometry throughout the semester. Back at the near the beginning of this course, uh, when we had talked about finite geometry, Sphano geometry was an example of a projective model. And the one that we're mostly interested in um, is RP2 here, the so-called real projective, uh, the real projective geometry. We've talked about this thing before, but as a reminder, what we're going to do is we're going to take the unit circ or the unit the unit um, disk. This is the closed disk, so that that the interior is included part of our geometry, but also the points on the circumference of the circle are part of our geometry. Now, this geometry had the, this is the set of points, but then in terms of the points, we have this wraparound feature that when you, when you go from one side of the circle, it'll map to the other side. So these two antipodal points here are actually identified as the same point on the geometry. Uh, so those two points are one and the same thing. And you often see this wraparound feature denoted in the following way. You draw these little arrows on antipodes of the sphere, but you point them in opposite directions. This is to somewhat suggest that there's a twist that happens when you go along here. So you can think of it as this unit circle. Some other models of the real projective plane. Some people, like in topology, they really like to draw it as a square. Uh, but with the square here, you have these... Uh, this reflective property that when you go to the opposite, when you hit the boundary, you're going to wrap around to the other side. So if you're chugging along and you hit the boundary here, you wrap around from the other side, but you there's a reflection that happens when you ref, when you hit the boundary right there. So that's another example. Um, a model that I really like, and we'll probably use this a lot in the future, is that we can we can describe our geometry as a hemisphere. So we think of like this upper hemisphere model. This back here is a dashed line because we don't see it. So we have this hemisphere model, which um, it's a hemisphere, but will wrap around the boundary. So there's that same wrap around on the boundary. And so a line in that geometry would look like a, a great semicircle uh, that goes around. So th that's th these are these three are all isomorphic copies of the real projective plane. So we have a finite a finite model, and just as a reminder, the Fano plane uh, looks like our Harry Potter 
model from before uh, when, of course, maybe Grindelwald's not defeated. He still has the Elder Wand, but then Dumbledore has one, for example, and then Voldemort has the third one. Uh, so we have those Deathly Hollows and the three Elder Wands. So this is our Fano geometry um, from the past there. Uh, let's see, I'm missing some points, right? We need a point right here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There they are. So we have our 7.7 .7 lines. Uh, so we want to talk about in general these Fano, uh, not well, these projective geometries. So uh, here's now the mega theorem for this lecture here. Um, this one's a little bit difficult to digest, but it's a really, really interesting theorem and a really elegant result when it comes to projective geometries. So let's start off with the projective geometry where the points of that geometry, we're going to call that set P and the lines in that geometry, we're going to call those set L. Uh, as it's described here. So we have a projective geometry, which it comes with points and it comes with lines, and there's an incidence relationship between uh, the points and lines there. So what I want you to do is that with this geometry, we're gonna fix a specific line, L. Just pick your favorite line in the geometry, and we're gonna call this, uh, this line's gonna get a special name. We're gonna refer to this line as the line at infinity. And for a projective geometry, it doesn't really matter which line becomes the line at infinity, but for this construction, we have to we have to be specific and we have to choose one. So we have this line at infinity, or sometimes it's called the ideal line. The ideal line, all right? So fix that line and then do the following construction. Uh, we're, gonna t we're gonna define a new set of points. We're gonna call that set P prime. Uh, P prime here, where P prime is all the points that were in the projective geometry except for the points on the line at infinity. All right. So I want to mention here that uh, the points, the points on L, are going to be called uh, the points at infinity. Points at infinity, or they're sometimes called ideal points. All right, and, uh, and for this lecture here, I will typically use the color blue to describe, describe points at infinity or the line at infinity. That is the ideal I'll describe using uh, the color blue. All right, and so getting back to the, to the set P prime here, uh, if you think of the line at infinity, it is a set of points. If you take away all those points at infinity um, and you take all the remaining points, you get what we're gonna call the ordinary points. Uh, you're going to get the ordinary points. Uh, and then, so, so related to that, is we're going to take every line that exists inside this geometry other than the line at infinity, and we are going to subtract the line at infinity away from M. That is, if you have a, if you have a projective line, sub subtract from it all of the ideal points and take the subset that only consists of ordinary points. So we had the ordinary points right before, and so these right here are going to represent our ordinary lines. Uh, we got our ordinary lines right there. So we've constructed this new geometry right here. And so let me kind of clear out this. Uh, let me clear out the screen a little bit because it's kind of getting messy. Kind of summarize what, we, what we're trying to describe right now. So what we're saying is we have this set of points, curly P, curly L, this is our projective geometry. This is the projective geometry. Then let's remove from all the, let's remove all the ideal points. So we're categorizing the, the types of points in this projective geometry. We have ideal points and we have ordinary points. If we only gather the ordinary points, that's what we mean by P prime. And if we, we can also segregate the line at infinity from all the ordinary lines, which admittedly the ordinary lines you take away their point at infinity. So this P prime represents all the ordinary points. This set L prime represents all the ordinary lines. And so this is our ordinary geometry. There is no infinity. There's no ideal going on in this ordinary geometry. Did you see an ideal point there in the ordinary geometry? No, you didn't. Uh, there are no ideal points in the ordinary geometry. So we're assuming that we start off with a projective geometry, and then as we dissect this geometry, the projective one to make an ordinary geometry, we claim that the ordinary geometry 
is going to be an affine geometry. Affine geometry, remember, it has the, uh, it's an incidence geometry which satisfies the elliptic parallel postulate, uh, excuse me, the Euclidean parallel postulate. And so I just also, so that's gonna be our theorem here. If we have a projective geometry, we can remove a line at infinity. That is, we pick a line, we say it's the line of infinity, we remove it, and then the consequential geometry formed by removing that line and all the points on that line, that will become an affine, or an affine geometry. So when I come back to these axioms of projective geometry, I want to mention that in the literature, these five axioms are not typically how one defines a uh, projective geometry. Typically, you take point existence, tip, or, sorry, line determination. You'll take the elliptic parallel postulate. But these three axioms right here are typically consolidated together into one axiom. Uh, and that axiom will say something like there exist four points, no three of which are collinear. Uh, that one, you can kind of argue that that statement, uh, I, I think I said it correctly. If I didn't, uh, maybe I can correct it later on in the comments, but I'm pretty sure that's the statement as, it's, as given there. And so that statement, that one axiom kind of is equivalent to these other three. The reason I'm opting for these five axioms is that I want these five axioms to resemble the axioms of affine geometry, which affine geometry uh, it has line determination. It has secant C, which is a stronger or which is a weaker version of tricant C. The fact that we actually take tricant C is that when you remove the points at infinity, you had three points, but now you maybe only have two. So we need an extra point. So then we remove the ideal points. We still have two points. Point existence, non-collinear are the same. And it turns out when you remove the ideal points, things that intersected in the projective geometry will actually be parallel in the ordinary geometry. So let's, let's talk about these axioms one by one by one. So let's first look at, at axiom I1, the line determinant axiom. So imagine we, and so we're trying to prove line determination for the ordinary geometry. We know that line determination holds for the projective geometry. So there's often this going back and forth between the ordinary with the projective. So imagine we have two ordinary points, A and B, like so. So these are ordinary points. Well. As there are ordinary points, there does exist a projective line. We'll do projective stuff in white. There's a projective line, we'll call it M, that harbors the two ordinary points, because every ordinary point is a projective point. But by tricancy, uh, let's see. Well, I, I guess I don't need tricancy yet. Um, we have the line at infinity, which we're going to do at blue. Um, the line because of the elliptic parallel postulate, we do know that the line at infinity intersects. Uh, well, I guess I guess what I'm trying to say right here is that we we have a projective line. Is there an ordinary line that'll contain a and b right here? Well, we can say for a fact that L, this line m is not the same thing as the line at infinity, um, because the line at infinity only contains the line of infinity only contains ideal points. Every point, or a point is ideal if and only if it's on the line of infinity. So although there could be some, there, there is gonna be some um, ideal point on M, because after all the line at infinity and the line M necessarily intersect, uh, they necessarily intersect at some ideal point, which we call P, right? So the line of infinity is this blue one right here. So M and L must intersect as projective lines at the point P. And because of line determination, uh, the intersection uh, between these two lines will be unique. So there's only one ideal point on this line M right here. So let's construct, uh, let's construct the ordinary line M prime by taking M subtract L. So if we only take the points except for, if we only take the points except for P, we take all the points except for P, oops. There's no point there anymore. Sorry, line infinity, you're gone. If we take away the line in infinity, then there is no other, there's no ideal points on here. We now have an ordinary line. This tells us that there is an ordinary line that contains these points, A and B. But what if we have a second ordinary line that does this? Like what if there's some line N prime that is a second ordinary line different from L, or different from M, excuse me, that contains A and B? Well, this ordinary line N prime can be extended into a projective line. It can be extended into a projective line, uh, call it N. 
And then this projective line, which is not M, it's not the line M. I mean, because if it were, it, it would have to be. I mean, I guess I, I take it back, right? Um, this line N prime would have to equal, the, sorry, the line N would have to be M because there's only one projective line that contains A and B by line determination. So N and M would have to be the same thing, which would imply that if N and M are the same thing, when you subtract the line N infinity, you would actually, because uh, N is just N take away L and M prime is just M take away L. If you take away L from both of these things, that forces that M prime equals M prime. Sorry, that was kind of a messy way of arguing this one, but the thing is, if you have two ordinary points, there exists a projective line that's between them. Uh, by line determination of the projective geometry, remove the point at infinity, that gives you an ordinary line. And it has to be unique, otherwise we get non-unique lines on the projective plane. So line determination works for this ordinary geometry. Um, let's talk about the next axiom, which is tricancy. Uh, sorry, about secancy. Um, for, for the projective geometry, we have secancy, or for tricancy, but for the project, for the ordinary geometry, we want secancy. So that's our goal in mind. We want to show that every line has at least two points. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with an ordinary line. So we have some ordinary line. We call it M prime. But an ordinary line is just a projective line that's a little bit longer because there's this extra point at infinity that's on the or, or on the projective line. So M is the white one. But P, it's a, it's a, it has to be a point at infinity because those are the only the points in the geometry that aren't ordinary. So this is going to be the intersection between the line at infinity and the line M. And so in particular, M prime doesn't contain the point P. Um, now, here, here you go. Here's the point. Um, by the tricancy axiom, there are going to be three points, at least three points on the projective line M. Now, one of those points is P, but the other two points have to be ordinary points. There has to be two points, maybe call them A and B, right? Um, why can't, because so tricancy gives us, tricancy is gonna give us three points, A, B, and P are some of those points we could do. But because of line determination, uh, the, uh, I mean, by the elliptic parallel posture, we know the line at infinity does intersect the line M at some ideal point P. But by line determination, the intersection between M and L is unique. So there can only be one ideal point on an ordinary projective line. And so since three points are guaranteed, the other two points have to necessarily be ordinary points. And therefore, if we go back to the line M prime, M prime contains at least two points. So we needed tricancy on projective lines to guarantee secancy for ordinary lines. And so that's that that right there is the main reason why we want to make sure that projective geometries have at least three points per line. So that when we remove the line in infinity, the, the resulting ordinary lines will have at least two points still on them. All right, let's talk about point existence. A point existence. Uh, why are there at least three points in the geometry? Well, let's start off with three projective points. Whoops. So in, in the projective geometry, which lives above the ordinary geometry, we have at least three points, A, B, and C. But we can also choose these points in such a way that they're non-collinear. Because uh, after all, uh, projective geometry is a incidence geometry. And we proved in incidence geometry there exists a set of three non-collinear points. So we have three uh, we have three non-collinear projective points. Now, the reason for non-collinearity is there's no one line that can contain all three of these points. In particular, the line at infinity, if it contained any of these points, um, it could only contain two of them. It can't contain all three of them. So we are guaranteed that one of these points is ordinary. And so without the loss of generality, let's assume that A is an ordinary point. That kind of looks sloppy. Let me try this again. Uh, we're going to recolor A as an ordinary point. Um, are B and C ordinary? We don't necessarily know that. But what we do know is the following, that if we take the projective line, uh, so the point A and the point B are projective points. If we take the line determined by A and B that's given by projective geometry, we get we get a projective line, and that projective line by tricancy contains a third point, which we'll call D. 
And likewise, the, the projective line determined by A and C, uh, it exists and it has to contain a third point, which we call E as well. And so these two lines, the line AB, uh, let's call it M, call that one M, and call the line determined by ACN. These two have to be ordinary lines because they're not the line at infinity. Because uh, after all, A is an ordinary point, it's not on L. And so because these, because M is an ordinary projective line, what we know is that it contains only one point at infinity. The other points on this, the other points on this uh, line have to be ordinary. So when you look between, when you look between D and B, one of those points is necessarily um, ordinary. And so let's say without the loss of generality, B was an ordinary point. Um, it could be that D is too, but we can only guarantee that B is an ordinary point. And now when we and so then when we when we switch over to the ordinary line M prime, we know that A and B are on that line. Now if we look at the projective line N, that line it's also can only contain it only contains exactly one ideal point. So when you look at these two points right here, C and E, one of them has to be ordinary. Um, they could both be ordinary, but one of them must be ordinary. So without the loss of generality, we could say C is an ordinary point right here. And so then if we think of the ordinary line in prime, then we see that we have, we've now found three ordinary points, A, B, and C. So our ordinary geometry has at least three points. Uh, so we get the point existence. Uh, next on the docket, we want to talk about non-collinearity axiom. So that, so what we want to show is that there is no ordinary line that contains all the ordinary points. So for the sake of contradiction, suppose there was. Suppose there was an ordinary line M prime that contains each and every one of the ordinary points. It has all of them. Well, as it's an ordinary line, it can be extended into a projective line. So think of that projective line M. And since it was an ordinary projective line, that means it contains one extra point, a point at infinity, which we'll call P. Uh, it's an ideal point, and that's just the one extra point we have there. Well, because the projective plane here is non-collinear, right? There exists a point uh, in the projective geometry, we're going to call it Q. There exists a projective, uh, a projective point that is not on the, the projective line M because the projective geometry has the non-collinearity axiom. So what I want you to do is consider the line that's determined by Q and an ordinary point that lives on M. So let's say we take the line between the points Q and A. All right. There exists a, there exists a ordinary uh, there, there exists uh, an ordinary point A, and there's this point Q right here. And so then, by tricancy, you notice how we use it again. By tricancy, actually, you can see in the proof over here, if you're reading along, you can see tricancy keeps on popping up over and over again. There's got to be a third point on this on this line right here, B, right? Um, this is a projective point. Now, there's a couple things that could happen. We know that A is we know that A is an ordinary point. Um, we know that this line right here, let's call this line N. I don't know if I gave it a, a name in the script there. I did. Let's call this line N. Whoops, we don't. Uh, yeah, sure, we can call it N. It's a projective line. Uh, we have this line N right here. So look at the line N. It contains B, A, and Q. A is an ordinary point. So this tells us that the line N is not the line at infinity. Likewise, N doesn't contain P. So also, it's not the line at infinity. So this is an ordinary line, an ordinary projective line, which means only one point on this line is ideal. Well, it could be that B is an ideal point, which means every other point on the line is ordinary, which would include the point Q. But this would show that Q is not on M prime, which would contradict M prime holding all the ordinary points. And then the other op the other option is also true that if Q was an ideal point, that would force B to be an ordinary point, and that would show that M prime doesn't contain it. So if we assume there is an ordinary line that contains all the ordinary points, we get a contradiction, which shows us that the the ordinary geometry uh, it satisfies non-collinearity. And now that we've shown um, line determination, tricancy, point existence, and non-collinearity. 
Uh, did I say all those ones right? Line determination, C can C point existence, and non-collinearity. We've now shown that the ordinary geometry is an incidence geometry. There's one more axiom to go to show that it is an affine geometry. We want to show that it satisfies the Euclidean parallel postulate. So to prove uh, to prove EPP for this geometry, what we're going to do is the following: We start off with just an arbitrary ordinary point, uh, ordinary line called M prime. Take a point that is not on, take an ordinary point that's not on the ordinary line, we're gonna call it A, and we wanna show there's only one parallel line through, there's only one ordinary parallel line through A with respect to M prime right here. So let's view these things as uh, projective geometries now. So what if we think of M prime as a projective line, M, well, because it's a projective line, there's ordinary points, mind you, but there's also this extra ideal point P. And let's take the let's take the projective line determined by P and A. Like here, right? We'll call that line um, N, I think is what I saw it. Yes, N. So N is the line determined by P and A, and M was the line that was given. Well, if we think of if we think of N prime. Right, M prime is just N take away L. Likewise, remember M prime was M take away L, like so. Then the, I, the ordinary line N prime doesn't contain P, right? Uh, just like how M prime doesn't contain P as well. And so the intersection that existed between N, M, the, so the intersection that, be, that exists between M and N is now removed. And so we don't have an intersection between M prime and N prime. Lines intersect at unique locations because uh, we have line determination. So therefore we get that these lines are now parallel. M prime is parallel to N prime. So it's kind of interesting. We took two intersecting projective lines and because we moved the point at infinity, they actually become parallel ordinary lines. But that's only half of the battle, right? We sh now shown that parallel lines exist in this ordinary geometry, uh, but are they unique? Let's suppose there was a second parallel line. So there's a second line that goes through A and it's parallel to M prime. We're gonna call this line N double prime. So M prime is parallel to N double prime. Uh, why, why can't this happen? Well, N prime is just, N double prime is equal to some line, uh, take away the line in infinity. That what I guess what I'm trying to say is this this line in double prime has to somewhere intersect an ideal line. It has to contain an ideal point, right? Um, if we think of this, if we think of n prime as a, if we think of n prime as a uh, projective line, then by the elliptic parallel postulate, this this projective n double prime must intersect m somewhere. And it's going to have to be at an ideal point. Well, because it intersect in this this extended n double prime intersects m at an ideal point, it's going to have to be p because that's the only ideal point that m has. And now you can see this is a problem with line determination on the projective geometry. Uh, n prime, the extended version, contains p and a, and likewise the extended n double prime also contains p and a as well. So this contradicts the line determination axiom of the projective geometry. And so we actually get that parallel lines are unique in this geometry. So whew, that was a big honker, wasn't it, right? It took us about 20 minutes, I think, to do that one. But this shows us that this ordinary geometry we constructed by removing the line at infinity of the projective geometry, it forms an affine geometry. So I think it's useful to look at some examples before we end this video right here. Um, let's take, for example, the... Fano plane, which is a finite projective geometry. We have points like the following. We have our three elder wands. We have the resurrection stone. And so we have the Fano plane right here. Well, who Who's going to be your line at infinity, right? In terms of the proof, it just said fix a line. It doesn't matter which line you choose. Because of the symmetries of the projective geometries, any line can act as the line at infinity. Now, when people talk about the Phantom Plane, they often pick the Resurrection Stone as the line at infinity. Because when you draw the typical di diagram 
for fan geometry. This configuration, all the lines look like straight edges, except for that resurrection stone. It looks like a circle. So sometimes people think that somehow that makes that circle exceptional. It really doesn't. It's just the way we draw it. But if we treat that as the line at infinity, what we want to do is consider what happens if we remove the line at infinity. So if we draw the picture again, get your cloak of invisibility, no resurrection stone. We only get elder wands now. Uh, we get the following. So I didn't draw the circle that time, but we also can't draw any of the points at infinity. We take away any ideal point. So like, for example, these three points that were on uh, the line at infinity, they have to go as well. And so you lose this one, this one, and this one. These points aren't there anymore. And so as I try to fix this picture, we have an ordinary point right here. We have an ordinary point right here. And we have an ordinary point right here and also right here. So we took away the three ideal points and we're left with four ordinary points. And if we try to salvage this thing, it's like, okay, we could draw some ordinary lines. We could reconstruct the cloak of invisibility. But in terms of uh, those Elder Wands, they all got broken in half. Harry Potter got on top of all three of them. Like so. And so let me kind of erase a little bit of the clutter there. Uh, but when you redraw this geometry, when you redraw that geometry, you get the following uh, residue right here. And I'm going to try this once more without any of the extra clutter. But when you draw this geometry, when you remove the line at infinity, you get these four points like this. And what does this geometry look like? Um, this might not be how we drew it originally, but this geometry right here is the four-point affine geometry. Or using language we used before, this is the order two um, affine geometry. Or what the book originally called four-point geometry. I mean, it's not the only four-point geometry because uh, there's the four-point fan geometry, but this is in fact an an affine geometry. So this kind of is evidence of what the theorem was proving that this, the, pr the theorem proved that this works in general, that if you remove a line from a projective geometry, you always get an affine geometry. All right. And so I also want to kind of mention it. If you think about uh, the projective model, the real projective plane we saw before, if you take this disc, which has the wraparound feature right here, um, well, let's treat Let's treat the wraparound line because it's kind of exceptional here, right? Let's take this to be our line at infinity. And so if we draw the geometry without the line at infinity, what we are going to do is we get an open disk. Uh, that is, we get all points whose distance from the origin is less than uh, one. We don't get the boundary. We just get the open disk itself. And that as a geometry is... Um, isomorphic to the Euclidean plane. If you want to, you could use like an arctangent map to make the finite distances extend to be of uh, infinite distance. But this does in fact become a Euclidean, this, this actually becomes Euclidean geometry in this situation. And so this right here is the main reason why we're trying to connect. Uh, that's why we, we brought back projective geometries here because um, the so what this construction what the theorem has done here is proven that given any projective geometry you can move a line and you form a euclidean geometry but this construction is also reversible given any euclidean geometry you can add a line at infinity right so if we think about our four point geometry here we can always add a line at infinity into the geometry and thus form a projective geometry from that. This is often called the projective cover of the affine geometry. And so the significance of this space RP2 is that RP2 is the projective cover of the Euclidean plane R2. And so this right here is going to be our official definition of elliptic geometry, but I'm poaching the next lecture a little bit. We'll talk some more about that next time why that's so we'll, we'll talk about next time why this is going to be our definition of elliptic geometry but we'll wait until then um an immediate consequence of what we have from the previous uh from that connection that is there's this one-to-one -one connection between affine geometries and projective geometries since affine geometries had an order which is the number of points on a line uh projective geometries also inherit an order 
Um, so like Phano Geometry is the order two. Uh, it's the order two projective geometry. Now you'll notice that the order two projective geometry actually has three points per line. Um, so when it comes to projective geometry, uh, each line, if you're order n, each line will contain n plus one points. It's also true that all points are incident to n plus one lines. Um, in projective geometry, there'll be n squared plus n plus one points and n squared plus n plus one lines. This is also true when you use um, infinite cardinals, although it becomes far less interesting because uh, it's all infinity. But for finite geometries, finite pr projective geometries, we can count the number of points, the number of lines, the number of incidence relationships, much like we did for affine geometry. Uh, basically, like how do we get this n squared plus n plus one uh, count here? Well, if you recall that for the affine geometry, affine geometry contains n squared points, um, and then we add, and, and, and every line contained n points. Well, we basically add to every line a new point, a point at, in, uh, a point at infinity. So the number, the number actually gets extended up to one. You get one extra one right here. I should actually be coloring this one here um, because points were already in incidents to n plus one lines. Um, it's, the, it's the number of lines that now contain n plus one points. And so because every line gains a new point, uh, well, 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 let's take this one for example. We had n squared plus n many lines. We add one new line and that gives us the line in infinity. So that's n squared plus n plus one many lines. Um, but then you had n squared points to begin with. And then the n plus, um, the n, we add extra points. And so that's where this extra n plus one is coming from. Uh, all these ideal points, because the line in infinity contains n plus one points. So you have the ordinary points plus the line in infinity, which contains n plus one ideal points as well. And so, whew, I told you that was a big one. I hope you brought some popcorn or maybe went to the bathroom before this video got started here. I guess you could pause it, um, whatever. But that, that draws us to the end of this, this sort of mammoth uh, proof here today, showing you uh, the connection between projective geometries and affine geometries. And as I've already alluded to, uh, this connection between um, affine geometry with the projective geometry is how we're going to proceed to develop elliptic geometry, because elliptic geometry is going to be the projective cover of the Euclidean plane, which is affine. Uh, if you like this video, please, please, please like it. Subscribe if you want to see some more. Uh, videos like this one. If you have any questions, post them in the comments below, or you can send me an email directly. That would be appreciative. As always, the script to this lecture uh, can be found, a link to it can be found in the description. And I will see you all next time. Have a fantastic day, everyone. Bye.